done because everything she's told you isn't true. Um, and, uh, and a little bit about um, my process and the, my creative process. And then I'd like to have a conversation and just like talk with you and see what I can share with you that might help in your process. Um, so I guess you can summarize my, my career today. It is, um, I thought of it this morning. It goes from tie-dye to Barney's and Bergdorf. So you say, well, how does that happen? So when I was 12 or 13, I, um, I discovered Janice Joplin. You know, and, and of course, what goes with that is tie-dye. Yeah. So um, I, what's in your household that's white besides sheets? Men's underwear. <laughs> My brothers and father had no whites left. <laughs> I thought they were beautiful. I don't know how they felt about it. But. So from there, I knew, I knew for me everything was about the blending of fashion and art. And I decided to study the School of the Art Institute because I was able to do that. And um, I had some really amazing experiences there. Um, I feel like everything is a building block to the next thing. And one thing that happened there was um, we had a, a presentation for a, um, a critique. And uh, it was, um, the judges were Genevieve Buck from the Tribune and Emmanuel Ongaro. And Genevieve Buck asked me if I had ever heard of, if I was inspired by Jeffrey Bean. And I said, no, in fact, I thought he was kind of a designer for old ladies' clothes. <laughs> Very old, you know, mature. So I uh, took myself to the 28th shop at Marshall Fields and discovered this amazing artist. Um, Jeffrey Bean, if you don't know about him, I highly recommend anyone studying fashion should know about him um, because he studied medicine before he went into fashion. And so his scenes and work, I mean, he kind of was a huge turning point in what we see and take for granted today, from Balmain and Balenciaga to Rick Owens, in terms of he studied the body and his seeming follows the musculature of the body. And it's what we see today, but he's really the source of it. So if you go back and look at his work, it's really quite spectacular. The funny part of that story is that, so I finished at the Art Institute. I went to New York wanting to work for him, and I decided I, I can be a little determined and a little hard-headed. <laughs> and I decided I didn't want to work for anyone else even if I had to intern for him and waitress at night, which is what I did. Um, because I felt like he was like this amazing master and I was determined to be in his, in his presence in whatever capacity I could be. Um, uh, interesting piece of that is what I came to realize after I was there a few months was there had never been any women in the design team. And unfortunately, Mr. Bean was, uh, that wasn't going to ever change, so I had the good fortune of staying on for two seasons as an intern. And I guess what I want to share with you is like, I feel like when you finish school, you're just barely beginning your education. And so for me, that was just like the perfect extension of my education. So I fast forward, I come back to Chicago, and um, I started um, a small collection under the name Redmento. And it was actually with, um, <coughs> whoops, got to point in the right direction, right? Um, so it's, I started with accessories. And what I didn't realize at the, that moment in time, according to Malcolm Gladwell, the idea of a tipping point, was that I knew I wanted to do accessories for a lot of reasons. I had an instinct about them being relevant in the moment. It was just as Pashminas had t taken off. Um, and I was so, it was, you know, it was timing and luck and all those things that come together. Um, if you recall a story named Ultimo in Chicago, Joan Weinstein was the first buyer to see my collection and to purchase it, which gave me the good fortune of then having doors open in New York. And you know, when I look back, I didn't realize like how this was really crazy. I mean, I was had appointments with Bernie, Barney's, Bergdorf's, and Sachs. I mean, that's unheard of. And so, I, I mean, I'm always so grateful for these things. And, and I, it's not that I didn't appreciate it, but it was moving so quickly that I just sort of like now reflect on it and go, oh, that's not the norm. Um, and so at that time, these accessories were really relevant more than they are at the moment because I think the Pashmina craze really brought an interest to accessories to the American market. And um, so we did these really lavish kinds of pieces, like, um, like the first one is actually a um, really amazing piece. It's actually um, sequin material that's over dyed and then cut and sewn onto chiffon. So it gives you an idea of kind of the the, the detail and embellishment and um, extravagance of the moment, I guess you could say. This is 1991. 
Um, this is a tool graph that's pleated, and um, here's a little cape, all tool, and um, again, hand sewn. Um, this is a sequin material that we printed, folded, and sewn on. Like, okay, how many more things can you do to a poor piece of sequin? Um, so, so the accessories kind of got me on the map. But what I realized was, that wasn't supposed to happen yet, but what I realized was I felt I was missing something in, from this cultural point of view. Like with clothing, there's such a three-dimensional part of it that accessories didn't offer me. So as an artist, I felt kind of frustrated. I didn't feel like I was, was fulfilled, and so I started pushing into ready to work. Fast forward, I was very fortunate again. I was picked up at Bergdorf, and through the course of my career, I had the good fortune of dressing some amazing, inspiring women, and um, being on the cover of a Bergdorf catalog, and um, you know, it's kind of those things when you look at this, you just kind of go, you're so grateful and so appreciative of what happened through this process. And later we can share like what most, I'd rather answer questions as to what around this you're curious about. So I'll just go through some other pieces of the puzzle right now. So what I'd like to talk to you about now is how I use inspiration and what my creative process is. Um, so for spring of 2008, one of my favorite collections is, uh, was inspired by Richard Serra, the sculptor. And you kind of go, well, how does that really relate to fashion? And so for me, the way I take the idea away is the idea of um, suspension and um, balance and space. And so how I interpreted that was this elliptical shape that spirals her body. Um, it also goes into um, this was a collar that was inspired by that, that image of the sculpture of squares. There's like 75 squares of hand cut organza. Um, but it always kind of goes back to like how does something suspend on the body, this insert of lace. And lastly, like this is a fairly heavy, heavy dress in sequins, and it's suspended on two pieces of bias, charmeuse. So it's kind of an intriguing part of the process as to how to make these actually function and not have, what do they call it, red, red carpet malfunctions. Um, <laughs> So it, it, to me, that's a, what I love about the, the art of designing clothing is all those parts. It's not just like the beautiful fabrics, but then, as you all know, anyone that's made a dress, the engineering of it. Um, so spring 2009, I was obsessed with the film by Sofia Coppola, um, Marie Antoinette. And what I loved about it was the spirit of this kind of free spirit, um, wild, beautiful colors, um, sort of a decadence that I just found really intriguing in terms of embellishment, which we brought into this and trying to make, but, but also when you look at my collections, I hope that it, they don't really look like the inspiration because the last thing I want you to think is, oh, she went to Santa Fe and there we have like turquoise dresses, you know? So I always use an inspiration in a very, um, I try to make it as a subliminal way. Um, here's that sort of Rococo bustle, but this is a cotton white little spring coat. So I love the, the kind of contrast of like this very common fabric, but in kind of a, a you know, a very couture-like silhouette. And this is, goes back to like all the bonbons and the confections and the colors, layers and layers of chiffon. Um, and if you take note of the hair as well, I have a very good friend here in Chicago named Charles Lord, um, who we, I would do the collection and then it was at a point where you kind of stop and you need other people to kind of resuscitate. You're, you know, you're, you're at this point where you go, is this all crazy or is it good? And so he would come in and then he'd get all inspired and he would do this wild hair and this and, and inspire the whole styling and photo shoots. Um, and this piece was really special in terms of um, layers and layers of tool. I mean, I guess at that point I never thought about I didn't look at like how much it's going to cost. I just looked at how can I make it the most beautiful it possibly can be. And it was at the moment that that was pretty, you know, acceptable. There was enough people that wanted these really extravagant, beautiful pieces, and so I didn't let that stop me. Um, and we'll talk about that as you, as I share. I'm 2057 with you. Um, so for fall 2009, I had seen an exhibit in New York called Rococo: The Continuous Curve, and it was beautiful. And it showed how Rococo, this kind of decadent, um, it's very, um, often it's more asymmetrical than this, but it's very flamboyant, and how it went through history and inspired artists such as Art Nouveau, and more importantly, what resonated with me was Ron Arad's chair. 
And so we took this idea of a continuous line, a continuous curve, and I it's one, one flowing beautiful piece of wood, right? And so it, we used that idea in our patterns, in our embellishment. So this collar became like this really technical, interesting piece that's one pattern, no seams. Um, here is the, in the embellishment, it's um, embroidered mohair and um, beads. The back of the dress flows through the bodice, so it's like this beautiful um, kind of Watteau back. Um, same here with like this kind of open, we showed it, we shot it nude, but you know, I'll, I'll dare you. Um, but it's like this whole idea again of like creating continuous lines through the body. Um, the last collection I'll show you is inspired by Tango. And what I found intriguing about Tango was the sort of idea of tension and, and how um, the whole movement. And, and so we use that as a guide to develop everything based on bias cutting. So it starts with this little top, which is cut on the bias, and the skirt is little organza uh, petals or hand cut, cut on the bias, and then extravag extravagantly inserted with little crystals. Um, here you see the bias pieces that are creating this flower running down our skirt. And then this is um, hundreds of little petals made out of bias cut, folded, hand tacked organza. And the last piece, so what, what I also want to share with you is what I find interesting about um, inspiration is how it flows from where you, every season, then it becomes part of your vocabulary. That's why I think it's really important to sort of always fuel my brain with like new ideas. Because as you see, there's a thread where Richard Serra started and continues. The Rococo continuous curve. The skirt is a continuous curve. It looks like kind of a crazy wild mess on the surface. It's 30 yards of chiffon. It's cut on the bias. It's um, strips that are then sewn. If you look at the inside of the dress, which I have to photograph so I can show it to you someday. The inside of the dress are these spirals that have started out very, it's very deliberate, even though it looks very undeliberate. It's these spirals that start small at the hip and then they open up through the hem and that creates this wild extravagance, right? Um, so the next piece I want to share with you is just, I've had the good fortune of um, sharing the creative process with other um, uh, artists, so to speak. And what I, I really enjoy that and it's taking it out of the fashion piece and making it be about something else, even though it might still have something to do with the body. So um, DIFA, this design industry fighting for AIDS, um, Donnie Medea from Blackbird invited me to work with this pastry chef to do a presentation in New York for a fundraiser. And the only criteria was chocolate. And she said, you know, what can we do if I heat the chocolate and we can spray it on the dress? I'm like, sure, why not? So I made this skirt out of, uh, it's a Yipur lace made out of, um, of uh, string. And, um, and then the top is leather. And we just put it on a mannequin, and we had it set up so that it could s spiral, turn, and she just shot it, shot away with chocolate. It was really cool. And what I liked about the piece is, like, you know, when you get in a room, I love the challenge of, like, when you want, I mean, we all watch Project Runway once in a while, right? So I love when you see what everyone does with an idea or a project. And what was interesting to me and um, Tara from Blackbird was, like, we came up with this thing that was just so outlier, so minimal and modern. And so that just always reminds me of like, sort of like the cleanness of what something could be as opposed to something so, so much more. 